a very personal perspective, um, and thank you for inviting me to, um, to join you at this fascinating few days. The previous speakers actually have perfectly set the scene for what I would like to say, so hopefully I can gain a bit of time. A lot of delegates over the last couple of days have looked rather vague when I said I was from Nottingham, so I'm glad I got this slide in. Uh, we are still in Europe. We will remain in Europe, whatever happens with Brexit. And we are, Nottingham is in right in the heart of England, and Nottingham is where Robin Hood is associated. And yes, I previously worked at the well, before in retirement, I was director of the Nottingham Clinical Trials Unit. So just, this is a very personal perspective. Um, who am I? You've just heard. I trained in Obstetrics and, and then in clinical epidemiology, and in particular in randomised trials. So I've designed and run largely perinatal trials so in pregnancy and childbirth. My early work was primarily in low and middle income countries. I am um, around hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, high blood pressure in pregnancy. I've been an editor and a reviewer with the Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth Group since it's, it's before its inception, even. Um, Cochrane is a, an international collaboration that collates the information from individual studies and disseminates it. And then latterly, I was director of the trials unit in Nottingham, which was a generic trials unit. So we did trials of, across a range of subjects, including breast cancer, hand surgery, skin conditions, etc. And throughout my research, from right at the very beginning, I've worked with patients and re parent representatives, because primarily I'm an obstetrician, as equal partners, um, and having stepped over the line as a patient with CLL, I think there's a lot that we can learn from other specialties. So I was diagnosed in 2009 um, at the age of 51. That was a bolt from the blue for me. The most difficult stage of my journey was the two weeks after um, I was diagnosed. I had kids of 30, age 13, and when in fact they were 11 and 12 at that time. I received chemotherapy, um, I had FCR in 2010, 2011. Um, I joined the Clarity trial, so I was one of the dots on <laughs> the slides you've just seen. Uh, as you've heard, it's a phase two clinical trial. It com it's the first study, I think, combining ibrutinib with venetoclax, and it was for relapse and resistant patients. I then retired due to ill and health six months after I started the trial. And I absolutely endorse the not jumping on the over-enthusiasm about the new agents. They're fantastic. The new agents are fantastic. But I retired not because of my CLL, but because of side effects of my treatment. That's what my CLL was getting better, but I felt worse. I went from being a fit, active professional. I ran a unit with 60 staff. We managed a budget of millions of pounds. I, was you know, I had a hugely packed highly stressful life that I really enjoyed. And I went from that to within a few months, barely been able to get out of bed. And when I did, I was in extreme pain with my joints. So it knocked me off my feet, literally. And I had loss of concentration. Within hours of starting Fanaticlax, I was talking nonsense in meetings. My colleague was kicking me on the table. You said that, Lelia. Um, and since I retired, at my retirement due, I chatted to, I happened to know, somebody who was there was Julia Brown, who directs the trials unit in Leeds. And I felt my hand bitten off when I said after retirement I would be interested in taking part in, as a patient, in trial, the CLL trials. So going back to my own story, uh, at the start of my research career, I was lucky enough to come across somebody called Ian Chalmers, who is the most remarkable person. He published this in 1991. He's an obstetrician. He set up the Cochrane Collaboration. He's still around, still active, even in his 70s. He published this seminal paper, The Perinatal Research Agenda, Whose Priorities? His argument was it was women's priorities that should determine that agenda. It's well worth a read. Even to this day, I often go back to it for reference. One of the examples he used, which is a really illustrates it very powerfully, is induction of labour. So when I started training in obstetrics and gynaecology, there were, I think, hundreds of trials about what drugs we should use to induce labour. There were virtually none on when you should induce labour. And those studies only started happening when women started saying, why the hell are you giving me these drugs in the first place? Why don't you just let me go into labour natu naturally? So there's now a large number of trials have been done looking at 
why you when you should induce labour. We should have done those first before we did the how. And I think there's lots of parallels with many other um, conditions. We've heard a lot already. I mean, Natasha has just set the scene perfectly why you should involve the public in research. So it reduces the mismatch between the research that's done and what is useful to the people who use the research, which is the clinicians who manage our help us and to patients, carers and families, the public. Um, it also, we've heard powerful arguments how it reduces waste in research funding and resources. There's no need to wait till you're battling with your ethics and your approval bodies to work out you've got your study design slightly wrong. If you involve the patients early on, they'll tell you these outcomes are not relevant to us. That's the wrong question. Your consent form's too long. Um, and in the UK particularly, it's increasingly expected by research funders. You will not get... Um, government funding in this country if you don't have patient involvement. It's now the norm. Um, and it's because it's been shown to improve the relevance of the research and the quality of the research. So again, a bit of my personal story. Um, in the last few years of my active life, I, worked on, I led a, a programme of work related to preterm birth, which is being born too soon. Horribly stressful thing for these families and for their babies. We had five work streams, but I wanted to, I'm only going to talk about what we called the priority setting partnership, which was the first phase. And just to illustrate, um, this is again building on what Natasha's just presented. So patient and public involvement in this programme of work that was funded by the National Institute of Health Research, which is the big government body in the UK. First of all, it changed the lang it's the language that we used. We never use the patient term in pregnancy and childbirth. Having a baby is not, does not make you a patient, no matter how sick you get. Having a baby is a physiological event that we all expect. We all know people who've had babies. Even the men know about you know, their partners, whatever. Everyone knows somebody who's had a baby. You're not a, a patient purely because you're pregnant. So the agreement in our group was that we'd use the term service users. The other commonly used what term in the UK is consumers. But that's, got a more, that's begun to have a different resonance. So we use the term service users to cover that umbrella of patient and public involvement. The, the topic that we, we were focusing on is when you cut, cut the baby's cord at birth, and this is women having babies months before they're due, highly stressful time. That topic was identified in discussion with parent representatives. So we decided on what we were, research we were going to do over several lunches and cups of coffee with various um, parent representatives. Um, and then as soon as we rolled it, before even, ro before even applying to the funding body, we went to, through one of the charities, we consulted with parents about who've had experience of this condition. And they were very wary of any research at this difficult time. It was so stressful for them, they couldn't imagine getting involved in research. So therefore, before we even went for funding, we made sure that we knew we had to have a strong parent perspective to ensure that it was relevant, and also to ensure that women, pe people would the women would participate in our research, because if we got it wrong, the clinicians wouldn't do it and the parents wouldn't take part. And we did this through, we, our representative representation was largely through the National Childbirth Trust, which is NCT, and Bliss, which is a charity that specialises in special care babies, the needs of special care babies and their families. Um, and our input included being, co there were two co um, rep parent representative co-applicants in our grant application. These, they sat on every, they were on our programme steering group, they attended four monthly meetings throughout the programme as equals and at the table and were fantastic contributors. They contributed to the detailed project management of our, we had 10 projects within the programme. They co-authored the publications and also an additional benefit is they've actively disseminated our research through their organisations. So they have their own meetings, ones like this, where the results have been presented back to their members. Um, so going back to the priority setting partnership, we use the James Lind Alliance, also set up by Ian Chalmers, um, aims to bring together patients, carers and clinicians. Researchers have no seat at the table. The argument has been that in the past, researchers have dominated the agenda. This is about... This is about five unanswered questions are important to patients, 
their carers and, their cl and the clinicians who look after them. And the aim is to ensure that people who fund research know that they do make those decisions about funding aware of these priorities. It's not saying you have to fund them, but have that, the, that information at the table when you make those decisions. So we did a preterm birth priority setting process. This is us at work. That's me at the far end. Um, as we go around the table, there are parent representatives, people who, adults who were born preterm, the parent of a, woman, of a child who was born preterm, as well as clinicians. Um, I'm not going to talk about the priorities. They're available. You can Google for them or ask me if you like. What I wanted to say, just say is just use this as an illustrative example of what difference patient involvement can make. So the, the James Lind Alliance process is two-stage. Basically, you have an online public survey, and then the final stage is a prioritization face-to-face -face workshop. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap in the priorities being between clinicians and parents. But they also differ. And the more interesting examples are when they differ. So we have a perfect example of where this, is a you know, this happened. So the question, how do stress, trauma, and physical workload contribute to the risk of preterm birth? And are there more effective ways to reduce those risks? In the public survey, that ranked third. It was second in priority for service users. And I think it was third overall in the public survey. It was discussed for a long time in the workshop, but it dropped down to number 18 because the, cl the clinicians in the room did not see it as a priority and there weren't enough service users in the room. To, so to, to put it really, summarise it, it's much more complex than that, but that's sort of what it boiled down to. And part of that was the difficulty of patient voices being heard which I have now a deeper understanding of, having moved to be the patient representative amongst the researchers. Um, so going back to the, the priority setting partnerships um, more generally, there are now 108 listed on the website. Priority setting is largely a local issue. So this is basically a UK initiative, but there are now several that have been done in other places such as Canada and Australia. And these are part of the 108. There were none for, there are currently none for either blood cancers generally or for CLL in particular. The only one of those 108 relevant to CLL is the one that's labeled living with and beyond cancer. And I was quite surprised. There are only four priority setting partnerships relevant to other cancers, which I found really surprising. So these are the top 10. It's all on the website. Don't try and read it all. Top 10 living with and beyond cancer. The top ones, you, I think, are broadly relevant to people with CLL. But the difficulty for a research funder would be that these are so broad that it's hard to know how you would actually design a study to tackle any of them. They're almost not so. They're more helpful. They're broad topics, but they're not hugely helpful for individual researchers and funders. And then as you come down, I put number eight in here because I thought actually pain, you can sit for the solid tumours, pain is a much bigger issue, I think, than for CLL. So I think in a CLL-specific process, that would probably drop down. And here again, we've got the diet, exercise, stress reduction coming up as number nine overall. So something that comes up again and again across a range of healthcare issues is something important to patients. And here's just a little example. Since I've retired, I've got more time. I was struggling with fatigue. I go to yoga classes. Um, a growing number of people, uh, the Magis centres around the country in the UK provide services for people with cancer. They all provide yoga classes. A lot of people with cancer use yoga as an additional way to improve their well-being. Um, I Google the, the references just slipped off the bottom here. The Cochrane database of systematic reviews. Include, I Googled, I found it. I thought, great, here's a systematic review of the trials of yoga, not instead of traditional care, but as well as standard care for patients with hematological malignancies. And then I opened it up, and the disappointment, there's one trial with 20 participants. And surprise, surprise, the conclusion is we have no idea what role yoga has. <laughs> You go to breast cancer. Breast cancer has a strong tradition. It's like maternity care. It's got a strong tradition of patient and public involvement. 
very, I've worked with them. We, we do, we're doing a trial of, in my unit of breast cancer. We have a woman with breast cancer at the table at every trial management group meeting. And that's for, there are, for breast cancer, there are 24 studies involving over 2,000 women of randomized trials for people with yoga. And the conclusions is that yoga was more effective than no therapy in improving the quality of life and reducing fatigue and sleep disturbances for people with breast cancer. And even better than that, yoga, in comparison with other things like counselling, yoga is still better. If I, had, if I had breast cancer, I'd be going to daily yoga classes. <laughs> and I'm left wondering, for my CLL, should I increase my yoga classes from once a week to perhaps two or three times a week? Because that looks really promising, but why don't we have trials in CLL? Or even blood cancer malignancies. Sorry, I'm just a bit slow with the... There we go. And again, Natasha talked about outcomes in clinical trials. Um, the, we, the trials are about, does something work? But in order to know whether it's working, you have to collect outcomes. And different people have different perspectives on what's working. Um, and I found this nice quote that I put at the bottom there. Clinical trials are only as credible as their endpoints, as the things that they report. So what happens when you involve patients? There are lots of case studies from outside CLL. Um, so this is one that I think is really nice. It's, you may not have heard of the OMER Act is an acronym for Outcome Measures for Arthritis Clinical Trials. They have an annual, the OMER Act collaboration have an annual meeting and they have done since the early 1990s. So in 1992, they agreed what's now called a core, what they called a core outcome set. So it was a group of out, sets of outcomes that all studies should collect so that you're making sure that every time you do a trial, you've got the maximum efficiency because you're collecting everything relevant that you want to know about that intervention. It wasn't until 2002, nearly 10 years later, that they invited patients to join the party. And they had their first patient perspective workshop. And what came out of that completely unexpectedly to the clinicians was that fatigue emerged as the most important issue to people with rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the bar and then, but the barriers to measuring fatigue in trials was how should it be measured? But it was clearly identified as a major issue. So at that meeting, they agreed a research agenda to understand fatigue better. And they then conduct, they met two years later and they reported some of the research. So I thought this was highly relevant to people with CLL. Um, so they've done some qualitative research to explore fatigue. Fatigue is overwhelming and different from normal tiredness. I'd agree with that. It permeates every sphere of your life. I would agree with that. Self-management is variable, but professional support is rare. I would absolutely agree with that in terms of my experiences. So they then added fatigue to the core outcome set. So it wasn't until patients got involved that they started measuring fatigue in the trials. And the patients ranked fatigue above pain in terms of their quality of life. Um, so what outcomes are important to CLL? This is just my personal perspective, having sat and talked to other patients. Um, are they measured in clinical trials? Well, I, apparently 10% of clinical trials across the blood cancers have, measured any, have got any measure of quality of life, which seems an appalling omission, really. And there's very little detail on side effects. So as already been said, we need to know about duration, frequency, severity. So is there a need for a core outcome set in CLL trials? I think there probably is. Um, oh, sorry, can I just go back one? So in conclusion, I think you know, patient there's lots we can learn from other areas. It, involving patients will improve the relevance and quality of research. And people planning CLL trials need to know what's important to um, people with CLL, what questions and what outcomes.